Introduction of The Privilege of Pain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. The Privilege of Pain by Carolyn Kane Mills Everett. Introduction. A very suggestive and intriguing title is The Privilege of Pain. Those who know a good deal about the subject will doubtless raise the eyebrow of incredulity, while those who have lived in blissful ignorance will be curious, if not wholly sympathetic. When I first heard the essay, since developed into this book, read before an audience of very thoughtful and discriminating women, I fancied, although it awakened the liveliest interest in all present, that there was not entire unanimity as to the essayist's point of view several invalids and semi-invalids wore an expression of modest pride in the eloquent plea that physical limitations had not succeeded in stemming the tide of mental and spiritual achievement in the long history of the world's progress robust ladies equal to eight hours work and if advisable eight hours play out of the twenty-four looked a trifle aggrieved as if the gift of perfect health had been underrated and the laurels that had always surmounted their shining hair and glowing faces might be wrested from them and placed on paler brows they had no wish to shorten the list of the essayists heroes heaven forbid but they evidently wished to retire to their private libraries and compile a roll of honour from the merely healthy however there was no acrimony in the discussion that followed the reading of the paper nor any desire to withhold honour where honour was so gloriously due those who disbelieved in the validity of pain those who were convinced that mind is not only superior to but able to win complete triumph over matter those who felt that laying hold of the great source of healing and power would enable them not only to deny but to defy pain these naturally were not completely in accord with the writer myself i have always thought that the happy waking after dreamless sleep the exultation in the new day in its appointed task the sense of vigour and ability to do whatever opportunity offered the feeling that one could run and not be weary could walk and not faint that these were the most precious things that the gods could vouchsafe to mankind and yet what of the latent powers that wake into life when we look into the bright face of danger our bodies are not commonly the temples that god intended them to be and yet often an unquenchable fire burns within an inner flame that incites to effort and achievement turns the timid slave into the happy warrior what if the strength born of overcoming should rescue dormant powers equal to those that exist where there is no effort save that engendered by abounding vitality after all life is an obstacle race to most of us who knows whether the horse could make a spectacular jump had he not often been confronted by bar gate hurdle and hedge i wonder how many great things have been carved painted written conceived invented where the creative human being has never suffered but has been sheltered lapped in ease the burden lifted from his shoulders i wonder if the eye that is seldom wet with tears is ever truly capable of the highest vision i think my own unregenerate watchword would be all for health and the world well lost so i am by no means a special pleader even yet for the privilege of pain but mrs everett's enthusiasm and the ardour of her conviction compels a new and more sympathetic understanding of her thesis i have more often seen spiritual and intellectual exaltation follow pain but both were present in one woman half poet half saint whose verses were written in intense suffering as indeed were most of w e henley's with closed eyes and pale lips she once quoted to me angel of pain i think thy face will be in all the heavenly place the earliest face that i shall see and swiftest face to smile on me how is it possible for you to say it i asked brokenly because she answered all dreams and all visions have come to me as well as all that i know of earth and heaven through pain it opens windows in what would otherwise be blank walls the blind deaf dumb maimed crippled if so be it the soul is strong seem to develop a splendid fighting spirit unknown to those who apparently have complete command of all their powers take one sense away and the others spring full armoured into more active service rob them of a right hand and the underrated left becomes doubly skilful these are soldiers in the army with banners and should be led and followed by acclaiming hosts i have known hundreds of invalids more or less saintly but i have had personal friendship with only two completely joyous triumphant ones robert louis stevenson and helen keller 
if one with god is a majority then two such conquering human creatures as these furnish inspiration for our generation and mrs everett in her eager search has found hundreds of similar examples for that reason i call this a unique gallant courageous helpful little book likely to give pluck and spirit to many readers handicapped by various ills there is nothing patient meek or resigned in its pages no air of being crushed but still smiling it simply radiates a plucky chin-in-the-air atmosphere calculated to make an aching hand pick up its pen brush lump of clay or shovel and go to work not grimly and doggedly with lips set but glowing in triumph over the secret adversary the magnificent company marshalled by mrs everett has an exhilarating effect upon hearer or reader as i listen to instance after instance of weakness gloriously transmuted into strength of personal grief and sorrow turned into joy for the whole world of vast knowledge spiritual and intellectual amassed bit by bit in the very grip of physical suffering i remembered the poetic pronouncement in revelation he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches to him that overcometh will i give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god kate douglas wiggin new york may 1920 end of introduction chapter one of the privilege of pain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by cassie the privilege of pain by caroline kane mills everett chapter one health and strength several years ago one of the new york papers published an interview with a well-known physician on the advisability of women being drafted for war he expressed himself in favor of their receiving military training although he casually remarked a good many would undoubtedly perish but he argued if we blot out the individual equation and judge from the standpoint of race would their perishing be regrettable he thinks not for objectors must remember he continues that mental and moral man gets his strength and efficiency only from the physical man a sick man just as a sick race is the one that goes to the wall this outrageous statement was published at the very height of the world war when men without arms legs eyes men permanently shattered in health men who will hide all their lives behind masks were crawling home in hordes and the worst of it is that practically everybody agrees with his verdict we offer these heroes who have sacrificed their splendid young bodies on the altar of humanity a few fine phrases about glory and honor yet are smugly content to allow them to be crushed by our degrading conviction that the heights of achievement are no longer for them now if a sick race could exist at all it might go to the wall as the doctor prophesies but when he narrows his contention to the individual when he declares that a sick man goes to the wall he is venturing a statement which only a surprising ignorance can excuse for what is more surprising than for an educated man a physician to put forward a claim which can be refuted by any one who has even a superficial knowledge of the past every one i have questioned has been able to recall at least one invalid who has attained a celebrity for instance all but the unlettered are familiar with the fact that both keats and robert louis stevenson were diseased the vast majority however even of cultivated people do not seem to realize what an extraordinarily large percentage of the greatest men and women have been physically handicapped it is the joyous mission of this book to prove to all invalids but more especially to those living victims of the great war that keats and stevenson far from representing isolated instances of achievement despite bodily infirmities 
are but members of a gallant army, some of whom have reached even greater heights in spite of more painful disabilities. The relation of insanity to genius has not escaped the notice of scholars, who have already exhaustively dealt with it. I intend, therefore, to confine myself to those giants of the past who have suffered either from disease, mutilation, or constitutional debility. If I have cited a few who have been afflicted with attacks of insanity, I have selected only those whose best work was done after recovering from such seizures, and have carefully excluded all who have had to pay with their intellects the price of a too stupendous vision. I wish furthermore to impress upon you that of all the illustrious men and women I shall enumerate, there is not one whose fullest development was not coincident with ill health, or reached after joining the ranks of the physically unfit. If we scrutinize more closely this heterogeneous assemblage, we shall discover that it is composed of representatives of the most varied forms of human endeavor saint and philosopher poet and scientist author and statesman musician and artist and what is really astonishing some of the greatest soldiers and one at least of the greatest sailors are among them end of chapter one recording by cassie chapter two of the privilege of pain this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassie. The Privilege of Pain by Caroline Kim Mills Everett. Chapter 2 Soldiers and a Sailor. Of all vocations, the profession of arms is the one for which it might be supposed that a perfect physique is the most essential. Yet Alexander, Caesar, Alfred the Great, John of Bohemia, Torstensen, Le Grand Condé, and his great rival Turin, Luxembourg, Napoleon, General Wolfe, and finally Lord Nelson, are proofs to die contrary. Alexander the Great, singular even among men of action for the splendor of his imagination was an epileptic so also was julius caesar the latter was often attacked by his malady on the very field of battle alfred so justly called the great was stricken in his twentieth year by a mysterious disease which caused him intense pain and from which he was never afterwards free the extent and diversity of his activities are however almost incredible he excelled as a soldier politician and administrator he was also a scholar and the revival of learning which took place under his reign was due solely to his efforts king john of bohemia stands out as the most romantic and chivalrous figure of the middle ages he dazzled his contemporaries by his exploits and his reputation for valor has never been exceeded he was overtaken by blindness at the age of forty-three but strapped to his horse continued to lead his armies to battle for six years this blind hero successfully resisted all the attacks of the emperor louise and his allies his heroic death at the battle of crecy was a fitting conclusion to a gallant life according to camden the ostrich feathers and the motto ishtin born ever since by the prince of wales originally formed the crest of king john and were first assumed by the black prince as a token of the admiration with which his antagonist inspired him conde known to history as le grand conde was so delicate in childhood that he was not expected to reach maturity and his nervous system was at no time to be trifled with during his innumerable campaigns he was a constant martyr to fevers and other maladies but these seldom interfered with his untiring energy or his capacity for work he had also the power of arousing the enthusiasm of his followers 
they said of him in the midst of misfortune conde always maintains the character of a hero turin is one of the captains whose campaigns napoleon recommended all soldiers to read and reread physical infirmities and an impediment in his speech hampered his career in youth however by devoting himself to bodily exercises he succeeded in a measure in overcoming his weaknesses but to the end he never possessed a normal physique count torstensen the brilliant swedish field marshal celebrated after gustavus adolphus as the hero of the thirty years war and compared to napoleon for the rapidity with which he was able to move his troops had frequently to lead his army from a litter as his infirmities would not permit him to mount a horse he is considered by experts to have been a greater man than his opponent tilly although the latter strangely enough has a more widespread reputation apropos luxembourg and william the third although the latter should be included among the statesmen i will quote a passage from macaulay in such an age sixteen ninety four bodily vigour is the most indispensable qualification for a warrior at the battle of landon two poor sickly beings who in a rude state of society would have been considered too puny to bear part in combats were the souls of two great armies and further on it is probable that the two feeblest in body among the hundred and twenty thousand soldiers that fought at near winden were the hunchbacked dwarf luxembourg who urged forward the fiery onset of france and the asthmatic skeleton william the third who covered the slow retreat of england napoleon was an epileptic and lord nelson at the height of his efficiency had lost an arm and an eye and what is even more remarkable was so it is said sick every time he went to sea or whenever the weather was exceptionally rough general wolf although only thirty-two years old was already a man of shattered health when he undertook his famous expedition against quebec in spite of disheartening failures and the torture of an internal malady he finally won the decisive victory which wrested quebec from the french during the battle he was twice wounded but refused to leave the field until a third bullet pierced his lawn he survived only long enough to give a final order for cutting off the retreat and breathed his last murmuring now god be praised i will die in peace let us consider for a moment what made these men preeminent it was not courage caesar and napoleon were no braver than thousands of their followers nor was it the capacity for endurance what then was the secret of their power i answer unhesitatingly imagination no leader has been without it and the greatest leaders are the men who have had it to a superlative degree napoleon recognized its mysterious sway for it was he who said imagination rules the world now imagination is the very quality we find most frequently allied to ill health i beg to call your attention that with the exception of le grand conde and possibly napoleon not one of these men would have passed his medical it is certainly curious that the profession of arms the most physically exacting of all professions is the only one whose greatest examples have without exception been tainted with disease End of chapter two Recording by Cassie Chapter 3 of The Privilege of Pain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassie The Privilege of Pain by Caroline K. Mills Everett chapter three 
of ill health and its relation to genius. The physical conditions which accompany and affect what we call genius are obscure and have hitherto attracted little but empirical notice. It is impossible not to see that absolutely normal man or woman, as we describe normality, is very rarely indeed an inventor or a seer or even a person of remarkable mental energy. The bulk of what are called entirely healthy people add nothing to the sum of human achievement and it is not the average navvy who makes a darwin nor a typical daughter of the plow who develops into an elizabeth barrett browning the more closely we study with extremely slender resources of evidence the lives of great men of imagination and action since the beginning of the world the more clearly we ought to recognize that a reduction of all types to one stolid uniformity of what is called health would have the effect of depriving humanity of precisely those individuals who have added most to the beauty and variety of human existence when the physical conditions of men of the highest celebrity in the past are touched upon it is usual to pass them over with indifference or else to account for them as the result of disease the peculiarities of pascal or of pope or of michelangelo are either denied or it is presumed that they were the result of purely morbid factors against which their genius their rectitude or their common sense more or less successfully contended it is admitted that tassel has a hypersensitive constitution which cruelty tortured into melancholia but it is taken for granted that he would have been a greater poet if he had taken plenty of outdoor exercise these are the conclusions of mr edmund goss and they are even more radical than mine it is however true that in sickness the perceptions physical mental and spiritual become supernormally acute and this extreme sensitiveness to impression is one of the attributes of genius it follows therefore that imagination is simulated by suffering but not that suffering creates genius or is even inseparably allied to it the most universal concomitant of genius is the power of concentration and there is nothing that so fosters that quality as ill health by forcing us to limit our activities our human contacts it automatically eliminates everything that is not the basic essential of each individual we may dream of an absolutely balanced man one equally supreme in mind body and spirit but i do not believe it possible for such a being to exist it seems to be a law that we must purchase and develop one faculty at the expense of another only by excessive application to one restricted form of activity can we excel in it genius is not eccentric it is concentric the all-round man is the mediocre man to perfect even a rose you must mutilate the bush of all the great men of imagination leonardo da vinci and goethe seem to have been the most superabundantly healthy this was certainly true of leonardo in his youth but i cannot help feeling that when he painted mona lisa's smile pain the great teacher was not unknown to him however i may be mistaken and if so he is the most complete man in the whole history of art science or literature for he joined the advantages of health without forfeiting the hypersensitiveness of suffering there is no doubt however about goethe he kept his splendid physique to the last and goethe was unquestionably a very great man his gigantic intellect is curiously stimulating no one else of whom i know with the exception of leonardo has had such a multiple outlook on life that amazing eye of his dissected as well as comprehended all that it rested upon 
and it rested upon almost everything tangible. But the very universality of Goethe's genius is one of his limitations. He gives so much, and yet there it is. He knows no half lights. He never leads one to those shadowy regions where the soul is in travail. He knows nothing of that mysterious tract which lies beyond the last outpost of the intellect. His imagination, even in its wildest flights, is curiously earthbound. I feel that he was too healthy. End of chapter three. Recording by Cassie. Chapter four of the privilege of pain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Privilege of Pain by Caroline Kane Mills Everett. Chapter four. Among the poets, they learn in suffering what they teach in song horace was a man of feeble health milton was blind pope deformed george herbert to whom we owe so many of our most beautiful hymns and anthems was consumptive john donne had an enormous influence on english literature although according to mr edmund gosse his influence was mostly malign he was praised by dryden paraphrased by pope and then completely forgotten for a century his versification is often harsh but behind that fantastic garb of language there is an earnest and vigorous mind and imagination that harbors fire within its cloudy folds and an insight into the mysteries of spiritual life which is often startling dunn excels in brief flashes of wit and beauty and in sudden daring phrases that have the full perfume of poetry in them isaac walton was his admiring friend and first biographer dunn was constantly ill during the years of his greatest creative activity yet this is what he once said speaking of his illnesses the advantage you and my other friends have by my frequent fevers is that i am so much the oftener at the gate of heaven and by the solitude and close imprisonment they reduce me to i am so much the oftener at my prayers in which you and my other dear friends are not forgotten it was owing to ill health that coleridge first took opium under the guise of a patent medicine william cowper early showed a tendency to melancholia but it was not until he was almost thirty that the prospects of having to appear at the bar of the house of lords preliminary to taking up the position of clerk a mere formality drove him completely insane he attempted suicide and was sent to an asylum where he spent eighteen months at the age of forty-two he had another attack from which it took him almost three years to recover completely nevertheless we find him three years later making his first appearance as an author with all the hymns written in conjunction with a friend this was followed by a collection of poems which was badly received one critic declaring that mr cowper was certainly a good pious man but without one spark of poetic fire it was not until seventeen eighty five when he was already fifty-four years old and had been twice declared insane that he published the book that was to make him famous it is entitled the task tercinium or a view of schools and the history of john gilpin cowper is among the poets who are epic makers he brought a new spirit into english verse with him begins the enthusiasm for humanity that was afterwards to become so marked in the poetry of burns shelley wordsworth and byron keats suffered from consumption and it is interesting to note that the progress of his disease coincided with the expansion of his genius 
chatterton is the most astounding and precocious figure in the whole history of letters he was only seventeen years and nine months old when starvation drove him to commit suicide but the best of his numerous productions both in prose and verse require no allowance to be made for the immaturity of their author chatterton's audience has never been a large one for the reason that with a few exceptions all his poems are written in fifteenth-century english among the discriminating however he holds a very high place his genius and tragic death are commemorated by wordsworth in resolution and independence by coleridge in amanity on the death of chatterton by d g rossetti in five english poets and keats dedicated endymion to his memory i have hesitated as to whether i had a right to include chatterton among my examples because i can find no record of his having suffered from actual disease on the other hand he was so abnormal that i feel that i have no right to ignore him from his earliest years he was subject to fits of abstraction during which he would sit for hours in seeming stupor from which it was almost impossible to wake him for a time he was even considered deficient in intellect thomas hood was a chronic invalid his most famous poem the bridge of sighs was written on his deathbed byron and swinburne were also physically handicapped w e henley was not only a poet but a trenchant critic and a successful editor a physical infirmity forced him at the age of twenty-five to become an inmate of an edinburgh hospital while there he wrote a number of poems in irregular rhythm describing with poignant force his experiences as a patient sent to the cornhill magazine they at once aroused the interest of leslie stephen the editor and induced him to visit the young poet and to take robert louis stevenson with him this meeting in the hospital and the friendship which ensued between stevenson and henley were famous in the literary gossip of the last century henley's reputation will rest on his poetry and the best of his poems will retain a permanent place in english literature as a literary editor he displayed a gift for discovering men of promise and views and reviews is a volume of notable criticism sidney lanier one of the most original and talented of american poets was consumptive and francis thompson author of the hound of heaven wrote his flaming verse under acute pain the sixteenth century was the heyday of poets princes regarded them as the chief ornament of their courts and disputed among themselves the honour of their company ronsard's life therefore was exceptionally fortunate he enjoyed the favour of the three sons of catherine de medici more especially of charles the ninth after whose premature death the poet retired from paris ronsard is celebrated as the chief glory of an association of poets who call themselves the pleiade his own generation bestowed upon him the title of prince of poets ronsard became deaf at eighteen and so he became a man of letters instead of a diplomatist his infirmity is probably responsible for a certain premature agedness a tranquil temperate sweetness which characterizes the school of poetry he founded joachim du bellay was destined for the army and his poetry would most probably have been lost to the world if he had not been attacked by a serious illness which seemed likely to prove fatal it was during the idle days of his convalescence that he first read the greek and latin poets he was also a member of the pleiade and some of his isolated pieces excel those of ronsard in airy lightness of touch moliere is the greatest name in french literature the facts as to his youth and early manhood are so wrapped in uncertainty that it is impossible to say when the frailty of his health first became manifest when he emerges from obscurity we find him already subject to attacks of illness and forced to limit himself to a milk diet his best work however was still undone tartuffe was not written until sixteen sixty four when moliere was already forty-two years old and le misanthrope was performed a year later although it had probably long been latent he first showed unmistakable symptoms of consumption in sixteen sixty seven in spite of the ravages of disease and the continual strain 
of an impossible domestic situation he produced le bourgeois gentilhomme three years later followed by les fourberies de scapin la malade et mégenaire was written shortly before his death and it was while acting the title role that he ruptured a blood vessel he died a few hours afterwards alone except for the casual presence of two sisters of charity scarron poet dramatist and novelist lived twenty years in a state of miserable deformity and pain his head and body were twisted his legs useless he bore his sufferings with invincible courage scarron was a prominent figure in the literary and fashionable society of his day his work however is very unequal that the roman burlesque is a novel of real merit no competent critic can deny it was republished during the nineteenth century not only in the original french but in an english translation scarron is also of interest as the first husband of the lady who as madame de maintenon became the wife of louis the fourteenth boileau was the youngest of fifteen children he is said to have had but one passion the hatred of stupid books he was the first critic to demonstrate the poetical possibilities of the french language his two masterpieces are la poétique and lutrin after much depreciation boileau's critical work has been rehabilitated and his judgments have been substantially adopted by his successors he suffered all his life from constitutional debility schiller was a leading spirit of his age yet from his thirty-second year every one of his nerves was an avenue of pain nevinson however considered it possible the disease served in some way to increase schiller's eager activity and fan his intellect into keener flame carlyle also writes of the poet that in the midst of his infirmities he persevered with unabated zeal in the great business of his life his frame might be impaired but his spirit retained its fire unextinguished schiller wrote some of his noblest and greatest plays during the periods of his most acute suffering when he died it was found that all his vital organs were deranged heinrich heine another immortal spent eight years of his agitated struggling life on what he called a mattress grave these years of suffering seem to have effected what might be called a spiritual purification of heine's nature and to have brought out all the good side of his character whereas adversity in earlier days had only emphasized his cynicism though crippled and racked with constant pain his intellectual and creative powers were no whit dim his greatest poems were written during these years of suffering from which he found relief only in death petrarch suffered from epilepsy and alfieri one of the greatest of the italian tragic poets was a martyr to pain so likewise was leopardi author of some immortal odes the latter was furthermore deformed it was said of him that pain and love are the twofold poetry of his existence camoin the greatest of portuguese poets lost his right eye attempting to board an enemy's ship after a life of incredible hardship he died in a public almshouse worn out by disease there are hardly any women poets which is rather curious as it is almost the only career that requires neither training nor paraphernalia yet among this handful we find four three of them being of real importance namely mrs browning christina rossetti and emily dickinson mrs browning was a chronic invalid and wrote her greatest poem sonnets from the portuguese while actually on her back mr edmund goss says of christina rossetti all we really know about her save that she was a great saint was that she was a great poet she was also a great sufferer the most curious event of american literary history was the sudden rise of emily dickinson into a posthumous fame this strange woman who shunned publicity with a morbid terror and never left her father's house for any house or town nevertheless bequeathed to the world poems which for life and fire are unexcelled she was an invalid in eighteen sixty three she writes i was ill since september and since april in boston for a physician's care he does not let me go yet i work in my prison and make guests for myself carlo her dog did not come because he would die in jail and the mountains i could not hold now so i brought but the gods francis ridley havergal wrote some of her most beautiful hymns on a sick bed
end of chapter four chapter five of the privilege of pain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the privilege of pain by caroline kane mills everett chapter five novelists the first name i find on my list of novelists who have been subject to ill health is that of cervantes he did not start life an invalid far from it he seems to have been a youth of unusual vigour but when only twenty-three years old he was severely wounded and lost his left hand in battle for the greater glory of the right as he gallantly exclaimed after that he spent five years in slavery and he escaped from the moors only to languish at various times in a spanish prison hardship and privations doubtless and also his old wounds had completely shattered his health when he finally sat down to create his immortal don quixote the first part was published when he was fifty-eight years old the last when he was sixty-nine when fielding wrote tom jones he had been for years a martyr to gout and other diseases gibbon predicted for this work a diuturnity exceeding that of the house of austria it is curious that this book which bubbles over with the joy of life was written at a time when fielding was plunged into the deepest melancholy swift suffered from labyrinthian vertigo lawrence stern creator of tristram shandy was consumptive as he says of himself from the first hour i drew breath unto this that i can hardly breathe at all stern no longer young was increasingly suffering during the years he brought forth the numerous volumes of his unique book sir walter scott was not only lame from infancy but is an inspiring example of what can be accomplished under conditions of extreme physical suffering when he was forty-six years old began a series of agonizing attacks of cramps of the stomach which recurred at frequent intervals for two years but his activity and capacity for work remained unbroken he made his initial attempt at playwriting when he was recovering from this first seizure before the year was out he had completed rob roy within six months it was followed by the heart of midlothian which filled four volumes of the second series of tales of my landlord and has remained one of the most popular among his novels the bride of lammermoor and the legend of montrose were dictated to amanuenses through fits of suffering so acute that he could not suppress cries of agony when laidlaw begged him to stop dictating he only answered nay willie only see that the doors are fast i would fain keep all the cry as well as all the wool to ourselves but to give over work that can only be when i am woollen madame de la fayette lost her health a year before her epoch-making novel la princesse de cleve was published she lived fifteen years afterwards et tant de ce as saint beuve says qui traînant leur miserable vie jusqu'à la dernière goutte d'huile la princesse de cleve is not only intrinsically a work of real merit which is still read with pleasure but is important because it is the first novel of sentiment the first novel in the sense we moderns use the word that was ever written lesage was a handsome engaging youth but it was not until he was thirty-nine years old that he made his first success with the diable boiteau already his deafness was rapidly increasing and he was sixty-seven years old and had long been completely deaf when the last volume of the masterpiece gil blas appeared vauvenargue was a soldier until he had both of his legs frozen during a winter campaign this injury from which he never recovered forced him to leave the army an attack of smallpox completed the ruin of his health and thenceforth he led a secluded life devoted to literary pursuits it is mainly as a novelist that vauvenargue occupies a place in french literature although his other works were held in high esteem by his contemporaries edmond and jules de goncourt are names famous in french literary history learning something from flaubert and teaching almost everything to zola they invented a new kind of novel and their works are the result of a new vision of the world a novel of the goncourt's is made up of an infinite number of details set side by side every detail equally prominent french critics have complained that the language of the goncourt is no longer the french of the past and this is true 
it is their distinction the finest of their inventions that in order to render new sensations a new vision of things they invented a new language mr arthur simons their journal is a gold-mine from which present-day writers still carry away unacknowledged nuggets m paul bourget said of them life reduced itself to a series of epileptic attacks preceded and followed by a blank dostoevsky is considered by many critics the greatest of the great russian novelists his health was completely shattered by his spending four years in a siberian prison as a political offender this terrible experience however served to create recollections of a dead house and buried alive in siberia anton chekhov the russian novelist and short story writer was only a little over twenty when he began to suffer from attacks of blood spitting although he believed that these came from his throat they were undoubtedly due to consumption he was also a martyr to digestive trouble and headaches chekhov possessed to an unusual degree the nervous energy which so frequently accompanies disease he was a remarkably prolific author so much so that in one of his letters he prophesies that he will soon have written enough to fill a library with his own works literature was however not his only pursuit he also practised medicine although he refused to receive any remuneration for his services he was public-spirited and altruistic and organized an association for the relief of siberian prisoners his books enjoy an immense vogue and have been translated into every language whatever may be the future of english fiction charlotte bronte's novels will always command attention by reason of their intensity and individuality she suffered from permanent bodily weakness with various complications some critics consider emily bronte superior to her sister wuthering heights is a thing apart passionate unforgettable this remarkable book was written while its author was dying of consumption that superwoman known to fame as george eliot suffered all her life from frequent attacks of illness in spite of her physical limitations she was capable of the most prolonged and intense application her numerous novels dating from her thirty-sixth year are only a part of her widespread intellectual activities jacobson the great danish novelist unfortunately too little known in this country was like so many others cut off from his chosen or destined profession and driven into literature by ill health during the worst phases of his sufferings he produced books that in their way have never been surpassed i must mention here though she belongs to no category that extraordinary child marie bashkirtseff who dying of consumption at twenty-four left behind her several pictures of great promise two of them are in the luxembourg gallery i believe and her journal a remarkable production which created a sensation thirty years ago and which has lately been republished robert louis stevenson's life is so well known that i need only recall him to your memory henry james was so delicate that he was forced to remain a spectator of the civil war in which his younger brothers fought mr edmund gosse writes the following description of a visit to henry james when the latter was already thirty-two years old stretched on a sofa and apologizing for not rising to greet me his appearance gave me a little shock for i had not thought of him as an invalid he hurriedly and rather evasively declared that he was not that but that a muscular weakness of the spine obliged him as he said to assume a horizontal posture during some hours of every day in order to bear an almost unbroken routine of evening engagements it is recorded that in one winter he dined out one hundred and seven times what amazing assiduity his health gradually grew stronger but for many years it seriously handicapped his activity i should like to linger a moment with lafcadio hearn he is known to the world at large as the foremost interpreter of the old and new japan he married a japanese wife and this gave him a peculiar insight into the customs as well as the psychology of his adopted countrymen his books show a unique understanding of the oriental mind and their literary art is exquisite he not only suffered from ill health but in addition lost the sight of one eye in early youth and ever after went in fear of total blindness yet far from regretting his afflictions this is what he said about them the owner of pure horse health never purchased the power of discerning the half-lights in its separation of the spiritual from the physical portion of existence severe sickness is often invaluable to the sufferer in the revelation it bestows of the psychological undercurrents of human existence from the intuitive recognition of the terrible but at the same time glorious fact 
that the highest life can only be reached by subordinating physical to spiritual influences separating the immaterial from the material self therein lies all the history of asceticism and self-suppression as the most efficacious measure of developing religious and intellectual power that is what experience had taught one who was certainly not a religionist end of chapter five chapter six of the privilege of pain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the privilege of pain by carolyn kane mills everett chapter six physical perfection and its relation to civilization i am persuaded that it is impossible to banish suffering from the world all we have so far accomplished is to exchange one form of suffering for another take the case of women for example and the elements to which they are subject primitive woman was virtually free from these she suffered little at childbirth today the operation of even the normal female functions has become a serious matter science with all its strides has not been able to cope successfully with the increasing burden which the conditions of modern life impose on woman's physique i have chosen women as an illustration because they themselves would be the first to insist that they have profited more than men from the advance of thought and the perfecting of a social system that is largely their own creation well compare this flower of the ages as we see her in shops offices ballrooms or even colleges with an australian bushwoman and we will find that neither in health strength nor endurance can she rival her savage sister the woman of the bush is capable of following her master all day with a baby on her back of stopping for a brief period to produce another and of resuming her progress unimpeded by her additional burden it is well to realize that civilization which has bestowed such incalculable benefits upon mankind has done so largely at the expense of its physical welfare moreover as men and more particularly women rise in the intellectual scale they risk the sacrifice not only of a robust but of a normal body but what of it wisdom is better than strength and a wise man is better than a strong man nor must we forget that while civilization has undoubtedly undermined our physique it has also abolished the circumstances which made strength and endurance the supreme necessities of the battle of life to be able to follow her mail with a child on her back to say nothing of the interesting interlude is not a quality that would add either to the allurement or efficiency of the woman of today. Let me here cite four celebrated women who, differing from each other in every other particular, suffered in common from ill health. The first in order of time is Madame du Dufond, who was for many years the center of one of the most brilliant of the eighteenth century salons. Her correspondence with Voltaire la duchesse chaucille and horace walpole is immortal and has been frequently republished many of her letters to voltaire and all of those to madame de chaucille and horace walpole were dictated when she was over sixty-seven years of age broken in health and totally blind rachel was the daughter of a poor jew peddler and from the age of four she roamed the streets singing patriotic songs a famous singing teacher heard her and impressed by the crude power of the little creature offered to teach her gratuitously it is almost unbelievable to read of the excitement this small plain jewess created she still lives in hundreds of books and is an integral part of the history of her period if we can judge from contemporary praises rachel is the greatest actress of whom there is any record she suffered from continual ill health and died of consumption 
in her thirty-seventh year grace darling was the daughter of a lighthouse keeper and with her father braved almost certain death in attempting to save the survivors of the wreck of the forfarshire by well-nigh superhuman efforts they succeeded in rescuing a great number this gallant exploit made them both famous grace darling had always been delicate and died of consumption four years later florence nightingale immortal nurse and one of the most influential women in history had at the time of her greatest activity a body so weak that it was a wonder how a woman in such delicate health was able to perform so much of what sidney herbert called a man's work during many years of important achievement she was altogether bedridden working incessantly writing organizing she was a power throughout the british empire her influence has spread over the world to her we owe the first idea of training nurses it is really curious that physical fitness should have become an ideal only after it had ceased to be the indispensable requirement of our environment piano moving is perhaps the sole occupation today where strength is the only qualification and intelligence of no account whatsoever yet few of us aspire to become piano movers the body is a most delicate machine and only in exceptional cases can it be kept through life in perfect condition without an immense expenditure of time and trouble now a perfect body should only be considered desirable if it enables us to rise to greater heights of achievement countless people however regard health and vigor not merely as the means but as the goal itself they tend and exercise their bodies at the expense of every other form of activity the disproportionate amount of time energy and aspiration that is wasted in attempting to perfect and preserve that which is inevitably doomed to destruction is incredible a child building a castle on the sand is engaged in a more durable occupation but the child while erecting its tunneled and turreted fortress is at least attempting to realize some haunting dream of the heights the depths the mystery and magnificence of life what matter the tide the vision is indestructible the greeks regarded a beautiful body as an end in itself because their civilization by permitting its unveiling allowed it to act as an inspiration to others the nude however has no recognized place among us and although it still serves to create beauty it does so under restricted and abnormal conditions to be a model is not a title to fame nor the ideal of our most enlightened contemporaries i hope that i have proved conclusively that a splendid body is no longer a necessary means of enabling us to rise to the greatest heights either of ambition or of service why therefore should we so morbidly covet physical perfection End of chapter 6 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 7 of The Privilege of Pain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Privilege of Pain by Carolyn Kane Mills Everett Chapter 7 The Physically Handicapped Philosophers Tavni froneni broto sigma thosada Tafni pathimathos ve ve kiriosin. Aeschylus, Agamemnon, line 186. Among the British philosophers who were physical sufferers, we find the great Francis Bacon, who, from childhood, was always weak and delicate. John Locke became world famous by reason of his still celebrated essay concerning human understanding. He was also of political importance.
having occupied for years the position of confidential adviser to the great earl of shaftesbury professor campbell says of him quote, locke is apt to be forgotten now because in his own generation he so well discharged the intellectual mission of initiating criticism of human knowledge and of diffusing the spirit of free enquiry and universal toleration which has since profoundly affected the civilized world he has not bequeathed an imposing system hardly even a striking discovery in metaphysics but he is a signal example in the anglo-saxon world of the love of attainable truth for the sake of truth and goodness if locke made few discoveries socrates made none but both are memorable in the record of human progress robert boyle the natural philosopher was the seventh son and fourteenth child of the great earl of cork his scientific work procured him extraordinary reputation among his contemporaries it was he who quote, first enunciated the law that the volume of gas varies inversely as the pressure which among english-speaking people is still called by his name end quote. great as were his attainments they were almost overshadowed by the saintliness of his character the liveliness of his wit and the incomparable charm of his manner boyle was a man of the most feeble health this is what evelyn says of him quote, the contexture of his body seemed to me so delicate that i have frequently compared him to venice glass which though wrought never so fine being carefully set up would outlast harder metals of daily use end quote. robert hooke the experimental philosopher was both deformed and diseased he was not a great man and his scientific achievements would have been quote, more striking if they had been less varied end quote. nevertheless he was renowned in his day and his contribution of real importance for although quote, he perfected little he originated much end quote. i mention him and shall mention several others who have been forgotten by all but scholars because i wish to show how large an army stands behind its illustrious chiefs besides if we contemplate only the giant luminaries of the firmament of fame we shall become discouraged they paralyze us by the very intensity of the admiration they evoke lesser men on the contrary for the reason that they are nearer our own orbit are more likely to stir us into emulation herbert spencer's achievements are too well known to necessitate further comment he was exceedingly delicate and at his best only able to work three hours a day descartes the foremost french philosopher had a feeble and somewhat abnormal body Quote, yet he considered it i am quoting mr edmund goss well suited to his own purposes and was convinced that the cartesian philosophy would not have been improved though the philosopher's digestion might by developing the thews of a ploughboy nicholas malbranche the great french cartesian philosopher was the tenth child of his parents although deformed and constitutionally feeble he was one of the most sought-after men of his day from all countries of the world but more especially from england be it said in her honor scholars writers and philosophers flocked to his door the german princes voyaged to paris expressly to see him the philosopher berkeley was probably the cause of his death by forcing himself on malbranche when the latter had been ordered absolute quiet his influence has been variously estimated spinoza is undoubtedly one of his disciples monsieur emile faguet says of him malbranche est un des plus beaux metaphysicians que j'ai rencontré si l'on vous m'a pensé je trouve descartes plus grand savant et plus vaste esprit mais je trouve ma branche plus grand philosophe d'un degré en moi que descartes lui-même speaking of his character he writes 
il n'y eut jamais un de plus d'esprit ni plus un de bien ni plus séduisant blaise pascal the great french religious philosopher still holds a position of immense importance in the history of literature as well as philosophy his provincial letters are the first example of polite controversial irony since lucian and they have continued to be the best example of it during more than two centuries in which style has been sedulously practised and in which they have furnished a model to generation after generation his pensées published after his death is quote, still a favourite exploring ground to persons who take an interest in their problems end quote. in philosophy his position is this quote, he seized firmly and fully the central idea of the difference between reason and religion but unlike most men since his day who not contented with a mere concordat have let religion go and contented themselves with the reason end quote. pascal though equally dissatisfied quote, held fast to religion and continued to fight out the questions of difference with reason end quote. from the age of eighteen pascal never passed a single day without pain nevertheless in the worst of his sufferings he was wont to say quote, do not pity me sickness is the natural condition of christians in sickness we are as we ought always to be in the suffering of pains in the privation of goods and of all the pleasures of the senses exempt from all passions which work in us during the whole course of our life without ambition without avarice in the continual expectation of death End quote. voltaire suffered frequent attacks of illness it was said of him that quote, he was born dying End quote. comte the french positive philosopher accomplished the bulk of his work after recovering from an attack of insanity during which he threw himself into the sin perhaps it is too soon to judge of the ultimate value of his system of philosophy it has had impassioned adherents as well as scornful critics his main thesis seems to be quote, that the improvement of social conditions can only be effected by moral development and never by any political mechanism or any violence in the way of an artificial redistribution of wealth end quote. in other words he preached that a moral transformation must precede any real advance yet he was not a christian an enemy defined comptism as catholicism without christianity henri frederic amiel swiss philosopher and critic whose chief work the journal in time published after his death obtained for him european reputation was a valetudinarian amiel wrote but little but all he accomplished has the quality of exquisite sensitiveness the great kant was a wretched little creature barely five feet high with a concave chest and a deformed right shoulder his constitution was of the frailest though by taking extraordinary precautions he escaped serious illness End of chapter 7. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 8 of The Privilege of Pain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Privilege of Pain by Carolyn Kane Mills Everett chapter eight astronomers and mathematicians johann kepler the great german astronomer was a contemporary of tycho brahe and galileo with both of whom he was in correspondence kepler's contributions to science were of the utmost importance it was he who established the two cardinal principles of modern astronomy the laws of elliptical orbits and of equal areas he also enunciated important truths relating to gravity in spite of the backward condition of mechanical knowledge he attempted to explain the planetary evolutions by a theory of vortices closely resembling that afterwards adopted by descartes he also prepared the way for the discovery of the infinitesimal calculus 
his literary remains were purchased by catherine the second of russia and were only published during the latter half of the nineteenth century it is impossible to consider without astonishment the colossal amount of work accomplished by kepler despite his great physical disabilities when only four years old an attack of smallpox had left him with crippled hands and eyesight permanently impaired his constitution already enfeebled by premature birth had to withstand successive shocks of illness flamstead the great british astronomer was obliged to leave school in consequence of a rheumatic affection of the joints it was to solace his enforced idleness that he took up the study of astronomy the extent and quality of his performance is almost unbelievable when one considers his severe physical suffering nicholas saunderson lost his sight before he was twelve months old yet he became professor of mathematics at cambridge he was an eminent authority in his day an original and efficient teacher and the author of a book on algebra his knowledge of optics was remarkable he had distinct ideas of perspective of the projection of the sphere and of the forms assumed by plane or solid figures d allen Baer was not only a mathematician but also a philosopher of the highest order he was made a member of the french academy at the age of twenty-four he was so frail that his life was continually despaired of and he remained a valetudinarian to the end end of chapter eight recording by john brandon chapter nine of the privilege of pain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the privilege of pain by carolyn kane mills everett chapter nine statesmen and politicians we now come to the statesmen and politicians robert cecil first earl of salisbury secretary of state under queen elizabeth and lord treasurer under james i was a statesman who all his life wielded immense power to the undoubted benefit of his country yet in person he was in strange contrast to his rivals at court being deformed and sickly elizabeth styled him her pygmy his enemies vilified him as wry neck crooked back and splayfoot in bacon's essay of deformity he paints his cousin to the life john somers lord keeper under william and mary was in some respects i am quoting macaulay the greatest man of his age he was equally imminent as a jurist as a politician and as a writer his humanity was the more remarkable because he received from nature a body such as is generally found united to a peevish and irritable mind his life was one long malady his nerves were weak his complexion livid his face prematurely wrinkled william the third i've already mentioned and now comes a name to conjure with the great lord clive founder of the british empire at eighteen he went out to india and shortly afterwards the effect of the climate on his health began to show itself in those fits of depression during one of which he ended his life we see in his end the result of physical suffering of chronic disease which opium failed to abate william pitt earl of chatham one of the greatest statesmen england ever had suffered from hereditary gout the attacks continued from boyhood with increasing intensity to the close of his life he was for two years mentally unbalanced yet after that he returned to parliament and directed for eight years all the power of his eloquence in favor of the american colonies dr johnson said walpole was a minister given by the king to the people but pitt was a minister given by the people to the king whatever we may think of marat as a man 
we cannot deny that he occupies a large place in the history of his time yet he was always delicate so much so that after the completion of one of his books he lay in a stupor during thirteen days in seventeen eighty eight he was attacked by a terrible malady from which he suffered during the whole of his revolutionary career pitt the younger was a sickly child and although he grew into a healthy youth his constitution was early broken by gout owing to an accident in early childhood talleyrand was lamed for life at the time this seemed a great misfortune for owing to his disability he forfeited his right of primogeniture and the profession of arms was closed to him no frenchman of his age did so much to repair the ravages wrought by fanatics and autocrats henry fawcett the english politician and economist was accidentally blinded at the age of twenty-five the effect of his blindness was as the event proved the reverse of calamitous by concentrating his energies it brought his powers to earlier maturity than would otherwise have been possible and it had a mellowing influence on his character which in youth had been rough and canny and inclined to harshness gladstone appointed him postmaster-general in eighteen eighty and not england alone but the world as well is deeply indebted to him for the reforms he inaugurated he instituted the parcel post postal orders sixpenny telegrams the banking of small savings by means of stamps and increased facilities for life insurance and annuities cavanaugh was an irish politician and a member of the privy council of ireland he had only the rudiments of legs and arms but in spite of these physical defects he had a remarkable career he learned to ride in the most fearless fashion strapped to a special saddle and managing his horse with the stumps of his arms he also fished shot drew and wrote various mechanical devices supplementing his limited physical capacities end of chapter nine recording by john brandon chapter ten of the privilege of pain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phil schempf the privilege of pain by carolyn kane mills everett the freedom of ill health one of the greatest advantages of invalidism is that it frees us from petty obligations unworthy pleasures and meaningless conventions the blessed freedom of ill health is something few people appreciate neither have they learned to make full use of its unearned leisure yet we are always clamoring for time in america apparently it can be found only in the sick room how many people do we not know who are so busy making what they are pleased to call a living that they never find time to live as a matter of fact only the small minority of the inefficient are obliged to sacrifice all possibility of leisure to the exigency of obtaining a livelihood the majority which include men and women of every class and of every vocation plumbers and captains of industry stenographers as well as debutantes are occupied in accumulating superfluities by superfluities i do not mean everything which is not normally necessary for the existence of the body but everything that is not essential to the perfect expansion of separate individuality the tendency of the day is to pour all mankind into the same mould to fetter great and small to the one ideal of obvious achievement we have degraded success by popularizing it we are suppressing individuality instead of fostering it and unless a change comes before long and the individual is again able to liberate himself and to germinate we shall perish as other civilizations have perished without leaving more than a scratch on the page of history <laughs>
for nations are ultimately judged not by their numbers their riches or their power but solely by the glory of the individuals they have produced think of the empires which have so completely vanished that but for a few broken stones we could not even guess the sites of their vast cities and compare these nations either to the jews or greeks who during their flowering gave birth to men who have conferred immortality on their respective races suffering quickens individuality by removing the pressure of circumstance custom and occupation moreover in the sick-room the intellect as well as the soul has not only the liberty but the time to mature it always surprises me to hear people complain of insomnia why should they consider it a misfortune to live precious hours instead of spending them in unconsciousness by sleeping even as much as five hours instead of nine we gain twenty-one hours a week think of it almost three working days the reason the average person is so exhausted by lying awake a few hours longer that he is accustomed to do is because he turns and twists in his bed bemoaning his sad fate until he has worked himself into a fever stay awake enjoy the night it is quite as wonderful as the day taste the charm of the silence as it steals by degrees over your weary spirit be grateful for these hours they are a gift from fate read write think meditate and when morning comes you will wake more refreshed after two hours sleep than you used to after nine napoleon and other great men never slept more end of chapter ten the freedom of ill health chapter eleven of the privilege of pain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nicalia the privilege of pain by caroline kane mills everett chapter eleven artists the great painters and sculptors seem to have been strangely healthy and normal i say that they seem to have been so because of the extreme difficulty of getting any accurate information on the subject it sounds incredible but i read a long life of petrarch in which everything was mentioned but his health and only discovered quite accidentally that he had been an epileptic i am therefore convinced that there are many examples i might cite if i could only unearth the truth yet even so i have been able to ferret out four artists who were physically handicapped navarrete called the spanish titian and celebrated under the name el muro was dumb they say that guercino squinted so badly that he could focus only one eye antoine Vatou suffered all his life from tuberculosis which no doubt accounts for a certain wistful gaiety which characterizes his work Vatou's position in french art is of unique importance he became the founder as the culmination of a new school which marked a revolt against the pompous classicism of the preceding period the vitality of his art was due to the rare combination of a poet's imagination with the power of seizing reality in his treatment of landscape background and the atmospheric conditions surrounding his figures we find the germ of impressionism from the middle of the eighteenth century until about eighteen seventy five Vatu's work fell into disrepute it was chiefly owing to the efforts of the brothers du goncourt that a reaction set in which has slowly carried Vatu to the summit of fame he died in his thirty-seventh year audrey beardsley flashed into fame with black and white drawings of extraordinary originality and beauty his peculiar technique has been widely imitated but never approached after twenty years his reputation has not yet reached its zenith aubrey beardsley during the whole of his meteoric career suffered from consumption he died at the age of twenty-six end of chapter eleven chapter twelve musicians one would expect deafness to be an insuperable obstacle to a musician yet beethoven produced a large part of his work while handicapped by it and some of his greatest compositions when his deafness had become complete 
Mozart was delicate and subject to fevers. His last work and his best was written just before his death. It was said of Handel, he was never greater than when, warned by palsy of the approach of death, and struggling with distress and suffering, he sat down to compose the great works which have made his name immortal in music. Schubert was barely five feet one and walked with a strange shuffling gait. His eyesight was so defective that he slept in his spectacles. He suffered from digestive trouble and died young. So did Chopin, having been an invalid the greater part of his short life. Mendelssohn was very frail and delicate. Karl Maria von Weber was not only ravaged by disease, but also deformed and lame. Paganini, the most extraordinary violinist the world has ever heard, suffered from tysis of the larynx and was constantly ill. The case of Robert Schumann is very curious. He was studying to be a pianist when, in attempting to strengthen his fingers, he accidentally paralyzed his right hand. To this apparent misfortune, we owe one of the greatest composers. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of The Privilege of Pain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Privilege of Pain by Carolyn Kane Mills Everett. Chapter 13 Three Physicians, a Naturalist, and a Chemist. Physician, heal thyself, might have been said to Sir William Harvey, the famous discoverer of the circulation of the blood, and to Albert von Haller, the great Swiss doctor who is considered the father of modern physiology. To Louis Pasteur, the world is indebted for the introductions of methods which have already worked wonders and bid fair to render possible the preventive treatment of all infectious disease. His most sensational discovery was the cure of hydrophobia, which he accomplished despite the fact that the special microbe causing this dread disease had not yet been isolated. Pasteur's motto was, Travailler, travailler toujours. On his deathbed, he turned to his devoted pupils and exclaimed, Où en êtes-vous? Que faites-vous? And ended by repeating, Il faut travailler. He once said, In the field of observation, chance only favors those who are prepared. This great benefactor of the human race, though loaded with honors, remained to the last simple and affectionate as a child. Pasteur was subject to fits of apoplexy, and it is curious that some of his most important discoveries were made immediately after such attacks. Darwin, from the age of thirty, was a great sufferer. His daughter writes, No one indeed except my mother knows the full amount of suffering he endured, or the full amount of his wonderful patience. Dr. Darwin, however, once said to a friend, If I had not been so great an invalid, I should not have done nearly so much work as I have accomplished. Dr. Trudeau, who worked such miracles for the cure of consumption, was himself consumptive. End of chapter 13 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 14 Inventors Sir Richard Arkwright, the inventor of the spinning jenny, though a man of great personal strength, suffered from wretched health. James Watt, the inventor of the steam engine, was continually ailing until he approached old age. He had a prodigious memory, and as an inventive genius he has never been surpassed. Ill health and failing eyesight forced Joseph Neepsey to retire from the army at the age of twenty-eight. It was during this opportune leisure that the idea of obtaining sun pictures first suggested itself to him. In 1826, he learnt that Daguerre was working on the same lines, and three years later they cooperated in order to perfect what was, however, Niepce's discovery. End of chapter 14 Recording by Linda Johnson
Chapter 15 of The Privilege of Pain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Privilege of Pain by Carolyn Kane Mills Everett. Chapter 15 Historians and Men of Letters. Aristides, surnamed Theodosius, was a Greek rhetorician and sophist. He was so celebrated that, in many places, statues were erected during his lifetime to commemorate his talents. He suffered for many years from a mysterious disease, which was, however, a positive benefit to his studies, as they were prescribed as part of his cure. Pliny the Younger was far from robust. He suffered from weakness of the eyes, throat, and chest, he himself speaks of his delicate frame. It has been said of Erasmus that he was the first man of letters since the fall of the Roman Empire. He occupied, during his lifetime, the position of supreme pontiff to an elect public which the ardors of the Renaissance had called into being. His admirers were to be found in every country and among all ranks presents were continually sent to him by great and small we hear of a donation of two hundred florins from pope clement the twelfth and of a contribution of comfits and sweetmeats from the nuns of cologne from england in particular he obtained constant supplies of money Quote, i receive daily he writes letters from the most remote parts from kings and princes prelates and men of learning and even from persons of whose existence i have never heard End quote. his position as regards the reformation has been for centuries a subject of passionate contention it was said of him quote, erasmus laid an egg and luther hatched it End quote. this however is only partly true as a matter of fact Erasmus had but one passion, the passion for learning. When he found that Luther's revolt aroused a new fanaticism, that of evangelism, he recoiled from the violence of the new preachers. Quote, Is it for this, he exclaimed, that we have shaken off bishops and popes, that we may come under the yoke of such madmen as Otto and Farrell? End quote. Erasmus's works are too numerous to enumerate separately. His greatest contribution is undoubtedly his Greek testament. Erasmus spent the greater part of his life in agony. For twenty years he was unable to sit down either to read, write, or even to take his meals. He could eat but little, and only of the most delicate meats. He could neither eat nor bear the smell of fish. My heart he said, is Catholic, but my stomach is Lutheran. Nevertheless, his various biographers exclaim at the amount of work he accomplished. One of them writes, Through the winter of 1514 to 1515, Erasmus worked with the strength of ten. In Venice, he did the work of two men. Montaigne was never strong, but after a few years at the court of Paris, his health gave way completely, and he retired to his castle, resolved to devote the rest of his life to study and contemplation. We undoubtedly owe his immortal essays to his invalidism. The same is true of Bantom. He was a soldier until a fall from his horse compelled him to retire into private life. This fortunate accident is directly responsible for his memoirs, which are not only delightful reading, but of the greatest historical value. Fenelon, the famous tutor to the Duke of Burgundy, had an enormous influence, not only on his own, but on the succeeding generations. His treatise on the education of girls guided French opinion on the subject for almost two centuries. This book brought him literary glory, together with the position of tutor to the grandson and heir of Louis the Fourteenth, During the eight years at court, he published the fables, the dialogues of the dead, and finally 
Telmac. These books were intended primarily for the instruction of his pupils. They became, however, universally popular. Fenelon was banished from Paris as a result of a doctrinal difference with Bossuet. Pope Innocent XIII, while upholding the latter, gave this verdict, quote, Fenelon errs by loving God too much, and Bossuet by loving his neighbor too little. End quote. Excessively delicate from childhood, Fenelon's health grew more and more feeble. While Archbishop of Cambrai, to which city he had retired after his disgrace, we read that he was forced to make his bed his retreat from whence to say his offices and administer his diocese. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, French philosopher, occupied during three years of his youth the position of footman in various houses. From his own account, he made an uncommonly bad one, impertinent, mean, untruthful, and dishonest. Rousseau had a most despicable character, and although he never lacked patrons, quarrelled with each in turn. Rousseau leapt into fame in 1749, when he was thirty-seven years old, by reason of an article extolling the savage over the civilized state. His two most celebrated books are Le Contrat Social and La Nouvelle Héloise. Only the indulgence of his contemporaries would have granted him the title of philosopher, but as a man of letters he occupies a place unrivaled in literary history. His fame, great as it was during his lifetime, reached to vertiginous heights after his death. Rousseau's health was execrable, and like Voltaire it was said of him that he was born dying. It might have been better for Lord Chesterfield if he had not dabbled with medicine. He would perhaps not have, quote, been so often his own patient, or entrusted his health to the care of empirics, end quote. Even before reaching middle age, his debilitated constitution had given him repeated warning of what he had to expect. When he wrote the renowned letters to his son, he was a deaf, solitary, sick man, who had to resort almost habitually to drugs to help him to endure his sufferings. Boswell's Life of Samuel Johnson is so universally familiar that I need only remind you that Dr. Johnson was scrofulous and half-blind. Horace Walpole occupied a curiously large place in the literary as well as the social life of the 18th century. Despite his prolific pen, the only one of his books which achieved popular success during his lifetime was The Castle of Otranto. It was translated into both French and Italian and has been frequently republished. It is a strange book, and I doubt if it will ever again be read with pleasure. Whatever significance it has for us lies in the fact that it forms the starting point of the great romantic revival. Walpole's diary, published after his death, is of the utmost historical importance. It is, however, chiefly by his letters that he will be remembered, for he is undoubtedly the greatest of the English letter writers. Walpole suffered all his life from frequent attacks of gout, which at times completely crippled him. Winkelmann, the famous German archaeologist, was the son of a poor shoemaker. He became librarian to Cardinal Passioni in 1754, and while occupying this position, he gave to the world a succession of admirable books. It was from him that scholars first obtained accurate information as to the treasures excavated at Pompeii. His greatest contribution to European literature is the history of ancient art. It is a delightful book, written with a free and impassioned pen, and marked an epoch by, quote, indicating the spirit in which the study of Greek art should be approached, and the methods by which investigators might hope to obtain solid results, end quote. He was a great friend of Goethe, and many, if not all of their letters have been preserved. Winkelmann was so delicate 
that he could never partake of anything but a little bread and wine his gentle blameless life was cut short by the hand of a murderer who killed him for the sake of a few ancient coins the gift of the empress maria theresa herder one of the most influential writers germany has produced was exceedingly delicate so also was our own washington irving which perhaps accounts for the extreme sensitiveness of the latter's impressions thierry the eminent french historian ransacked the archives with such unremitting zeal that on the eve of beginning to write his history he became totally blind Quote, but he never lost heart and in making friends with darkness End quote. as he puts it he returned to his work and by means of dictation was able to finish the masterpiece that was to prove the foundation of a new school of history thierry said if as i believe the progress of science is to be numbered among the glories of our land i should again take the road that brought me to this pass blind and suffering without any respite or hope of recovery i can still witness to one point that coming from me admits of no doubt that there is something in the world of higher value than material enjoyment nay even than bodily health and that is devotion to science End quote. thus was the road discovered which was to be followed by prescott sismondi macaulay and many others including professor rank charles lamb had a mental breakdown at the age of nineteen and mary lamb suffered from frequent attacks of insanity sir w f p napier's health was permanently injured during a campaign which carried hostilities into spain this obliged him to retire from the army at the age of thirty-four this unwelcome leisure was an inestimable benefit not only to himself but to the world as it permitted him to become the greatest military historian that england has ever produced carlyle became a chronic invalid in his twenty-fourth year the precise nature of his ailment it is impossible to ascertain but he declared that a rat was continually gnawing at the pit of his stomach a most remarkable example of achievement in the face of terrible physical disabilities is presented by the historian francis parkman he was unable to open his eyes except in the dark so that all his information had to be read aloud to him while he made notes with his eyes shut by means of a machine he had invented as a guide to his hand for years he suffered so intensely that half an hour's application exhausted him the superb works he left behind composed despite such incredible physical obstacles have been a splendid legacy to his country prescott the eminent american historian suffered while at harvard an accident which changed the course of his life a hard piece of bread thrown at random in the commons hall struck his left eye and destroyed the sight nevertheless he graduated honorably but when he entered his father's office as a student of law the uninjured eye showed dangerous symptoms of inflammation he was urged therefore to travel and it was at the azores where he had to spend much of his time in a darkened room that he quote, began the mental discipline which enabled him to compose and retain in memory long passages for subsequent dictation end quote his secretary gives this picture of him while writing the history of the reign of ferdinand and isabella quote, seated in a study lined on two sides with books and darkened by screens of blue muslin which required readjustment with every cloud that passed across the sky end quote. prescott trained his memory until he was able to retain sixty pages of printed matter quote, turning and returning them as he walked or drove end quote. after fifty his remaining eye showed serious symptoms of enfeeblement and his general health also gave cause for alarm 
nevertheless he gallantly set to work on his history of philip the second the third volume was however not through the press before an attack of apoplexy put an end to his life alfred enger english divine and man of letters chiefly remembered for his sympathetic writings on charles lamb and thomas hood was often speechless with prostration from headaches and sickness enger was no more than a charming writer i only insert him because his handicap is one of the most difficult to overcome singe the remarkable irish dramatist was delicate and died young end of chapter fifteen recording by linda johnson chapter sixteen of the privilege of pain this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Privilege of Pain by Carolyn Kane Mills Everett Chapter 16 Protestant Reformers Luther stands out as the most powerful figure of the Reformation. Protestant churches of every denomination owe to him their inception, not so much on points of dogma as because the success of his revolt made theirs possible. Luther was afflicted with epilepsy, and at times from other disabilities, the exact nature of which I have been unable to ascertain. Like so many other renowned invalids, we are struck with the amount of work he accomplished. During the last ten years of his life, he suffered from continuous ill health, yet he spent them in incessant labor. He was preaching with vehemence and fervor on February 19, 1546, when suddenly he said, quietly, this and much more is to be said about the gospel, but I am too weak and will close here. Four days later he was dead. Calvin suffered constant bodily pain, yet he was a man of incessant activity and of supreme courage. At one time, not only the council, but the people of Geneva revolted against his authority. A riot was imminent. Calvin at once set out alone for the council chamber, where he was greeted with yells and threats of death. Advancing slowly into their midst, he bared his breast, saying, if you will have blood, strike here. Not an arm moved, and turning his back on his enemies, he slowly mounted the stairs to the tribune. John Knox began his career as a Catholic priest, and we have so little knowledge of his early life that we are ignorant as to what occasioned the startling change in his views. After his ascension to the ranks of Protestantism, he had at first no idea of preaching, but confined himself to instructing his friend's children. His friends, however, recognized his capacity, and on his refusing to run where God had not called him, they planned a solemn appeal to Knox from the pulpit to accept the public office in charge of preaching. At the close of this exhortation, Knox burst into tears and shut himself in his chamber, in heaviness for many days. The call had at last found a leader of men, yet it was an invitation to danger and to death. Shortly afterward, St. Andrews was attacked by the French fleet, and Knox was among the prisoners taken. He was thrown into a galley, and for 19 months remained in irons and subject to the lash. When he was finally released, he was a man almost 45 years old and completely broken in health by reason of hardships and cruelty to which he'd been subjected. Yet his career was only beginning. To Knox, more than to any other man, Scotland owes her religion and individuality. He was of great political importance and one of the most powerful enemies of Maria Stuart. As an historian, he occupies an important place. His History of the Reformation in Scotland is a remarkable book. It was said of him, he neither flattered nor feared any flesh. He was an inspired preacher. Elizabeth's very critical ambassador wrote from Edinburgh that this one man was able in one hour to put more life in us than 500 trumpets. Richard Baxter was diseased from head to foot. Nevertheless, he became celebrated as the most eminent of the English Protestant schoolmen. He was also of political importance and instrumental in bringing about the restoration of Charles II. End of chapter 16. Chapter 15 of The Privilege of Pain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Privilege of Pain by Carolyn Kane Mills Everett. Chapter 15 The Saints. 
when we look into god's face we do not feel his hand health is a form of capital and like any other capital may be either well or ill invested moreover we can squander it foolishly or convert it into the supreme oblation and to most of us life itself is a less difficult sacrifice the tragedy of war is not so much the toll of the dead as the lists of the disabled few of us are given the chance of dying for others but to all of us is offered the privilege of spending ourselves for humanity either individually or collectively countless parents fathers as well as mothers purchase with their own lives and health life vigor and opportunity for their children the instinct of sacrifice is to a greater or less degree universal to parenthood and although i do not wish to belittle their offering i think it even more admirable when placed on a less obvious altar numberless people are daily overspending their physical resources in the service of mankind by the furtherance of knowledge the improvement of material conditions by widening the door of opportunity or carrying the message of the spirit into teeming slum and arid desert others give themselves with equal prodigality in a more limited and less glorious field of their personal contacts not merely to their homes their dependents and friends but to all who come even casually within the radius of their fellowship it seems to me difficult to live at the height of our possibilities more especially if our activities are purely selfless without being at times tempted to withdraw our health account the soldier is only one of a great host whose bodies have been sacrificed in the performance of an imperative duty health is often purchased at the price of ignominious refusal it is therefore not surprising that a large proportion of the saints were men and women with ruined bodies bodies that have been rapturously spent in the service of god and man i will mention only a few of the most renowned saint jerome one of the greatest of the early christian fathers lived an unregenerate life until a severe illness induced a complete change in him and he resolved to renounce everything that kept him back from god his greatest temptation was the study of the literature of greece and pagan rome and he determined from thenceforth to devote all his vast scholarship to the holy scriptures and to christianity to him we owe the first translation of the bible into latin commonly known as the vulgate very few men have ever wielded greater power over the minds of men than saint augustine he is today a living force yet he struggled all his life against consumption he lived however to be seventy-six saint bernard of clairvaux the most famous monk and preacher of the middle ages was a martyr to so many physical infirmities that at first sight he appeared like one near unto death all this suffering however never quelled his ardent spirit or his overmastering zeal for purging the world of sin it was saint bernard who said nothing can work me damage but myself the harm i sustain i carry about with me and i am never a real sufferer but by my own fault saint francis of assisi was a gay dissipated youth when a severe illness put a stop to his pleasures and gave him time to reflect so that he became dissatisfied with his mode of life on his recovery he set out on a military expedition but at the end of the first day's march he fell ill and had to return to assisi this disappointment brought on another spiritual crisis and shortly afterwards he went on a pilgrimage to rome before everything he was an ascetic and a mystic an ascetic who though gentle to others wore out his body in self-denial so much so that when he came to die he begged pardon of brother ass the body for having unduly ill-treated it saint catherine of siena was not only a very great saint but one of the greatest women that ever lived the daughter of a poor dyer 
who learned to read when she was twenty and to write when she was twenty-seven or eight she dictated books and letters celebrated not only for their spiritual fragrance and literary value but also for their great historical importance no empress ever wielded greater power than this extraordinary woman toward the end of her life her court consisted of pilgrims who flocked daily by the thousands to visit her the miracle of her personality had its effect on all who approached her a young libertine belonging to one of the most aristocratic families of siena after one interview with this dyer's daughter abandoned his former life and became her humble follower until the day of her death she converted a notorious robber who for years terrorized the vicinity of siena and had almost paralyzed its commerce as a proof of the sincerity of his repentance he gave her his stronghold together with all the spoils he had accumulated the abandonment of avignon as the seat of the papal court undoubtedly changed not only the map but also the history of europe and it was solely owing to saint catherine's passionate insistence that pope gregory the eleventh returned to rome despite his own reluctance and the opposition of his cardinals during her short life she was continually ill and during the period of her greatest activity she was dying st ignatius loyola one of the most remarkable and influential personages in the history of the catholic church led the adventurous life of a courtier and a soldier until he received a wound at the siege of pamplona according to an old chronicler this was the occasion of his conversion to god a cannon-ball hit his legs shattering one serious illness followed the most painful operation and for weeks his life was despaired of it was on the bed of torment which he eventually left lame for life and constitutionally enfeebled that grace came to him the saint himself said when he returned from the valley of the shadow i have seen god face to face and my soul has been saved from that time onward he devoted himself to a spiritual life wandering far and accomplishing much chief among his achievements was the founding of the order of jesuits i must mention here a very remarkable fact that has however nothing to do with my thesis in his will he bequeathed to the order he founded this legacy that all men should speak ill of it it is also curious that he who benefited by illness should have said a sound mind in a sound body is the most useful instrument with which to serve god saint teresa of jesus the great spanish saint whose personality and writings have never lost their influence was always extremely delicate and during the period of her greatest accomplishments not only ill but old with saint teresa closes my list of those gallant souls who apparently unfit for the battle of life have nevertheless left their mark on history and civilization and i wish to remind you again that i have mentioned no one whose height of achievement has not been coincident with ill health or reached after the suffering of some serious physical disability neither have i thought it proper to cite any of the numerous instances of handicapped genius among our living contemporaries i am certain that many other names might be presented to your consideration if it were not for my own ignorance as well as the extreme difficulty of getting any reliable data on the subject end of chapter fifteen recording by john brandon Chapters 18 and 19 of The Privilege of Pain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. The Privilege of Pain by Carolyn Kane Mills Everett. Chapter 18 Pain, the Great Teacher. What does he know? said a sage. Who has not suffered? 
that we may be benefited by physical suffering is no new idea it is not even a forgotten idea from the time when civilization first expressed itself in terms of christianity until the reformation the spiritual value of pain has been an undisputed axiom the catholic church has never ceased to preach the mortification of the flesh and all religious communities heathen as well as christian consider a certain degree of asceticism necessary for the perfect manifestation of a spiritual life as to the merits of voluntary suffering inflicted for the purpose of subjugating the appetites of the body christendom differs fundamentally but until recently it has been united in regarding illness as one of the means by which providence purifies as well as punishes its children the discovery of the germ even more than the preaching of mrs eddy dealt a terrific blow to this ancient belief with the result that the masses no longer regard physical suffering as a remedial agency but as something not only unprofitable but purely destructive for more than thirty years the final abolition of pain has been the mecca towards which doctors and christian scientists have passionately journeyed moreover their ranks have been swelled by numerous sects schools or religious bodies that have been called into existence by the rallying cry of this new hope they pointed to the declining death rate as an irrefutable testimony of battles already won and as disease after disease disappeared before the advance of sanitation of serums or of right thought as surgery developed unheard-of possibilities the most limitless expectations seem not unjustified the natural infirmities of age must eventually yield before the onslaught of knowledge bolder spirits even dreamed of conquest over death then the world war came their boasted death rate mounted to unheard-of heights the maimed and blind overflowed from the hospitals unto the furthest corners of the earth still the havoc was not complete infantile paralysis came from the north killing and crippling our children by thousands finally influenza mowed down old and young in such numbers that even here in america it was impossible to care for all the victims one would have expected these facts to be a staggering blow to our theorists could they not have realized if only dimly that they were battling against some fundamental law evidently not for according to them war is to be abolished not only that but dr voronoff now offers an infallible cure for old age now as i said before i neither believe that physical suffering will ever be abolished nor do i even hope it for pain is one of the great human and humanizing experiences and since the beginning of time each generation has learned in its school the same fundamental lessons when a man is laboring under the pain of any distemper it is then that he recollects there is a god and that he is but a man no mortal is then the object of his envy his admiration or his contempt and having no malice to gratify the tales of slander excite him not this is the testimony of a heathen pliny who was himself an invalid sixteen centuries later an anglican divine jeremy taylor voiced a similar conviction in sickness the soul begins to dress herself for immortality at first she unties the strings of vanity that have made her upper garments cleave to the world and sit uneasy even during the materialistic nineteenth century we find dr samuel smiles declaring suffering is doubtless as divinely appointed as joy while it is much more influential as a discipline of character it chastens and sweetens the nature teaches patience and resignation and promotes the deepest as well as the most exalted thoughts latterly there have been indications that this time-honoured conception is again becoming more universally recognised for instance during the darkest days of the war the bishop of london writes that he had come to believe that a painless world is a world not regenerate but degenerate who shall say that the revival of religious feeling which is now taking place is not due to the physical and mental suffering entailed by the war i should like to linger on the spiritual value of suffering yet i feel i am on very delicate ground for the spirit is so gloriously independent of the flesh that it can expand under any circumstances and in any habitation st hildegard believed god could not dwell in a healthy body and st ignatius loyola that a healthy mind in a healthy body is the best instrument with which to serve god yet he himself had a shattered body the efficacy of suffering in promoting the growth of the spirit seems to me to lie chiefly in the fact that it does for us what we so seldom have the courage to do for ourselves it sweeps away all the rubbish and dust of life in the blessed emptiness induced by this mental house-cleaning we are able often for the first time to separate clearly the essential from the unessential in sickness soul and body demand instinctively only that which is for each its most imperative necessity in the crucible of suffering the true essence of our character becomes manifest 
all our pitiable pretenses are torn from us leaving our inherent self face to face with reality it is a tremendous experience it must either break us or make us it is for us to choose which it shall be suffering is the ultimate test of character yet as i write these words i find myself wondering if there is any one ultimate test as no two crystals react to the same solvent so it may be that no two hearts respond to the same probe of one thing nevertheless i am certain to each of us is applied at some time in our lives that which constitutes for the individual soul the supreme trial of its metal i am frequently reminded however that there are countless people who instead of being purified and sensitized by physical pain have been destroyed or at least rendered sterile by it this is undoubtedly true whether we are to profit by suffering or not depends entirely on ourselves how then are we to transmute pain into privilege certainly not through resignation for there is no virtue without action it may only be the interior travail of the spirit but to attain even the initial step to spiritual intellectual or material advancement necessitates labor so it is with the benefits of suffering they are there within the reach of all but can only be obtained as the wage of persistent endeavor resignation is not merely inactive it is positively harmful inasmuch as it is a tacit acknowledgment that pain is in itself an evil and to believe that is to stultify its possibilities for what we believe to be evil no matter how innocent in itself becomes so by the corrosive power of that belief it is a dogma of christianity that disease is one of the punitive consequences of original sin now punishment implies correction therefore if disease represents a fall from perfection it also holds within it the germs of a future perfection although theology teaches sin as the inception of disease yet if we consider only the immediate cause of our physical disabilities we will find that although they are frequently the result of breaking a moral law they are quite as frequently to be attributed to no fault of our own and may even be the emblem of sacrifice if so many fail to benefit through suffering we must remember that only a few of us are able to sustain the daily test of life every experience especially any great and unusual experience is a fire through which few pass unscathed beauty charm riches personality even intellect have each their separate temptation their different limitations it is so easy for the spirit to sleep contented within the soft prison of a perfect body superabundant health and vitality unless guided by infinite wisdom are as likely to cast us into the abyss of life as to raise us to the summit power fosters pride and charm is the twin sister of vanity life is a continuous trial of our strength but disease is not necessarily the supreme trial it was george eliot who said there is nothing the body suffers the soul may not profit by chapter nineteen conclusion who best can suffer best can do milton we have seen that as mankind rises in the scale of civilization the body becomes increasingly less important nevertheless i wish it to be clearly understood that i do not maintain that it is preferable to be ill than well but only that each state has its own peculiar privileges which are rarely interchangeable health and sickness are merely different roads to achievement the earth requires rain as well as sunshine we need both tears and laughter navvies are necessary and so are philosophers you may therefore reasonably ask why if suffering is indispensable to humanity doctors and sociologists should spend themselves and their lives in attempting to banish it from the world because if pain is the gate through which we must pass to attain certain experiences and realizations to battle against it is undoubtedly the road to others to endure pain and to relieve pain are both instrumental in freeing us from the prison of ourselves and freedom from self is the only real freedom moreover whatever ameliorates human conditions whether serums or sanitation free concerts or fireless cookers results in loosing us from the thraldom of the body the race reaches towards an ideal of ultimate perfection just as a plant stretches upward towards the sun both are unattainable yet all activity would cease if we demanded nothing less than absolute and indestructible achievement the tide flows only to ebb the field must be sown anew year after year we build cities knowing that time will eventually destroy them we bear children doomed to death but after the ebb comes the tide bringing ever new treasures to our shores the germ of spring lies hidden in the barren breast of autumn out of the ashes of vast cities still greater cities will arise and death is but the portal of life no physical disablement is a barrier to achievement 
this is the glorious fact which the illustrious men and women i have enumerated have proved beyond the possibility of dispute to cripple and hunchback to blind deaf and dumb to those chained to a mattress grave and to those who have been mentally unbalanced they have bequeathed this precious legacy of hope on the other hand we can no longer plead our infirmities as an excuse for our weakness our sterility or failure for whatever may be our disablement we can find in history a parallel debility triumphantly transmuted into strength the end end of the privilege of pain by carolyn kane mills everett